Good morning. Just taking care of a couple of technical things really quick. And we'll get started here. Okay, so everybody should be able to see the presentation now and see my little window up here where I'm at too, hopefully. And this should take usually about an hour or so. And if you have any questions, you can post them in the question and answer section of Zoom or email them later. I'll show you how to do that and I can answer them. This is going to be recorded as well. So if you have to leave or anything, then you'll get a link uh, to be able to see it later. So, uh, and again, any questions that you have, if there's something, this always happens, uh, an hour after this is over, you'll think, oh, I wish that they would have said something about that, or I wish I would have asked this question. I'll give you my email address at the end, and you can go ahead and just email those anytime. So we'll get started. Uh, this is a presentation that um, we give for uh, communities around the Valley, and it's a little bit different than the presentation that I gave last night that's more oriented towards hikers and people that are outdoors. This is for people that are uh, not wanting to see snakes at your house, which is what I assume most of you are in that in a camp probably. Can everybody hear me okay? If someone could drop a, uh, a note in the chat real fast just to make sure before I start really getting into it. So my name is Brian Hughes and I own a company called Rattlesnake Solutions. I'm in Cave Creek, Arizona right now, which is just north of Phoenix, but we are all over the place. Uh, we have a dedicated team in the Tucson area as well. And there are also people that are right, living right next to your community that are um, um, there every day, <laughs> essentially. So um, what we do is we work with homeowners to solve rattlesnake issues that you might have. And we also do conservation projects and uh, research and other tasks that are related to rattlesnake conservation. Um, and one of the interesting things that people, and a, you, a lot of people probably really don't like rattlesnakes and that's totally fine. That's why we have our job. Um, but we are able to, the best way to solve this conflict between homeowners and rattlesnakes actually involves no, no blood or anything like that at all from, from anything. So the snakes can live on one side of the fence and you guys can live on the other and everybody's happy there. The reason that I am able to speak about rattlesnakes with, with some authority here and um, uh, even though some of you may have grown up here uh, and have seen a lot of rattlesnakes in your life and have experience with that is that I'm, I'm around rattlesnakes all the time, every day. Uh, our, our business moves about 1,400 rattlesnakes a year from homes. Uh, I, in, through this room here, there's, there's a whole bunch of rattlesnakes that I work with. Uh, I live where rattlesnakes do and spend my free time and part of my work time traveling around the, the world looking for venomous snakes. So I'm around them all the time. Every single day of my life, a rattlesnake strikes at me and how that situation looks to me at this point is going to be different than it would be to uh, the average person. So that's why I'm able to, to have that context where I can speak to this a little bit differently. Uh, here is myself and some of our team um, in, uh, this is in the Amazon last January, uh, right before this whole COVID thing happened with the, the largest viper in the world, that's a Bushmaster. Uh, a couple of people there that are notable that you might meet someday. Um, the person on the far right, his name is Michael. He is uh, he manages our, our fencing operation down in the Tucson area. So we spend a lot of time <laughs> around snakes. So if you live in Arizona, you probably have thoughts one way or another about how you, about rattlesnakes. It's kind of a polarizing topic. Um, not a lot of people like them. Some people like them, but there's not a lot of people that are just kind of, well, I don't really think about them. If you can have snakes in your yard, you probably uh, have strong feelings about rattlesnakes. And in Arizona, we have lots of them. We have more rattlesnakes than, than any other place in the country by far. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but that's kind of why we need this type of um, communication. And my job couldn't exist anywhere else other than these areas. 
So in Arizona, we have 15 different species of rattlesnake. You could also see that as 13 species. Um, and both of those are correct. It just depends on what, what literature you're reading at the time. I'm making a little adjustment here. Okay, sorry about that. I just want to make sure I was sharing the right screen here. So out of those 15 species, six of those are in the Phoenix city limits, but Tucson is also very similar to where you're at. Uh, you're going to have five of those, um, but as soon as you get into the mountains there, then you have Arizona black rattlesnakes as well. So that means that Arizona has more rattlesnake diversity uh, and species than any other place. And every day of my life, there's somebody that messages me all upset, like, well, I grew up in Texas, so we know about snakes and you don't. That's great, but uh, Tucson and your area has uh, more, just your little area has more rattlesnake diversity than the entire state of Texas. And the density and numbers are, are, are higher as well. So you really live in rattlesnake central in the country. Um, so this is very important information for you to, to know. It doesn't mean you're in danger. In fact, it's kind of the opposite. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, I'm going to go through some of the animals that you can find in your area. And, you know, a lot of this is just kind of trivia. It's, it's not necessarily relevant to your safety, but it does help show you kind of how, what's there. This snake is a Western Diamondback rattlesnake. They're the most common snake that you're going to see there. Um, and not just common, most common rattlesnake, but the most common snake. They're very uh, active all over the place, in the community and around it. And they're also the largest rattlesnake. So when you see a snake that's standing up and it's doing that kind of classic S pose, like in the gas station on the way to Phoenix that you're gonna see, it's usually a Western Diamondback. They end up being in people's yards pretty often just because, well, they are generalists. So there are things that they can find in yards or on the edge of a golf course or in these communities that are useful to them. So they end up in those situations and that's where people come into contact with them quite a bit. A uh, very large one in your area is about four feet long. That's a monster. one. You will hear people talk about an eight foot rattlesnake that they saw, you know, I'm, I'm sure it felt like it was eight feet long and it looked really big, but a four foot rattlesnake in Arizona is just a monster. And the way that I know that is not just from literature that I read, but also part of my job is in our uh, research projects is I actually go out and measure rattlesnakes. So it's amazing how rattlesnakes, I can look at it, even though I have a lot of experience and context with it, I can look at, wow, that is the biggest rattlesnake I've ever seen in my life. And then I catch it and measure it and it ends up being the same three and a half foot <laughs> of rattlesnake. So there's something that happens in our minds when you're looking at something like this. And we'll talk about that some more later. They're often found like this. They sneak around a lot in communities like yours, wherever there is activity, the rattlesnakes have adapted to stay kind of quiet. And it's not an evolutionary thing. It's just that they see a lot of people so they don't care as much anymore. So they spend a lot of time hiding. Big snakes, usually noticeable, a lot of them rattle. So as soon as you start getting into the mountains a little bit, uh, in the foothills, you run into these guys. This is a black-tailed rattlesnake. They're also very large. People mistake them for another type of snake. They're very often called a Mojave rattlesnake because black tails tend to be a greenish color. Um, they're big snakes. And the easiest way to tell the difference between a Mojave rattlesnake and a black-tailed rattlesnake is that if you are in habitat and you're in terrain that could be described even loosely as mountainous, then you're probably not looking at a, a Mojave. Blacktails live in mountains. Mojaves live in flat, deserty areas. Both of those can be found within a couple of miles of your community. Here's one that we found eating a squirrel. If you're a squirrel, you probably feel very differently about rattlesnakes than I do. Uh, also, just kind of a cautionary tale. Don't be bitten by a blacktail rattlesnake, especially if you're a squirrel. You also have tiger rattlesnakes around your community. Um, these guys are very, very toxic snakes, but most people have never heard of a, rattles, of a tiger rattlesnake, even though they're one of the most common snakes in your area. And that's just because they're very secretive. They spend a lot of time hiding. They're, uh, 
uh, nocturnal much of the year. They just kind of sneak around. Um, so I find quite a few of them in our, our research areas, but even in those places where there's lots of people and hikers and stuff, people just don't really run into them very often. Really cool little snakes, little mini head. Big oversized rattle <laughs> too, so it looks like someone put them together backwards. Uh, it is unlikely that you'll ever see this type of, of rattlesnake. You can, if you go hiking at Sabino Canyon or something, then you can see them, but for the most part, they're very hidden. So the Mojave rattlesnake, most people have heard of this one, and it's a little bit of, a, of an urban legend. This is a real snake. It's a real species of snake, and they're very common. But there is a the, the idea that they are hyper aggressive and that they'll chase you down and come after your car or, 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 or you know, do a lot of things that snakes just don't do. So there's a lot of mythology about this particular animal and it's based on a real animal. And this kind of touches on what most of this presentation is about. It's not just safety, but it is about making you, you know, the goal of this is to make it so that if you are worried about snakes, to be able to provide you with information so that you can more rationally approach the topic and ultimately feel better about where you live, feel better about this idea that you could run into a rattlesnake. So Mojave's are really a big part of that because they are, they're such a part of local lore. They're such a part, there's such an urban legend about them that a Mojave rattlesnake is going to act differently than these other types of snakes that it can actually change your perception so I can, you know, immediately if I have 20 people in a room that I'm talking to, a couple of them are going to have personal experiences that can contradict what, what I'm saying about these snakes. Well, I, I remember clearly that a Mojave rattlesnake chased me or something like that. And I believe that you have those experiences. But the way that our minds perceive things, especially when we are, um, we are in a higher state of, of anxiety or fear about them um, and just not understanding necessarily the context of what that behavior is can lead to a lot of those things. So the easiest way for me to illustrate that is just to say that I, I see hundreds of Mojave rattlesnakes a year. Uh, my team does as well. We run into them all the time and I'm never chased by Mojave rattlesnakes. People that see them several times in their life are chased by all of them. So the difference there is not that we're seeing different animals, but perception and the context of that kind of thing. So Mojave rattlesnakes, just like diamondbacks and other ones, they cannot uh, jump through the air. They do not chase after people. They have no interest in chasing down a person on horseback or attacking their truck tires, that kind of thing. And this, there's gonna be a lot about this coming up. So I'm not gonna focus on this one, but low sandy areas, probably the South and Western part of the community is gonna be uh, where you're gonna more commonly run into this species. They look a lot like Western diamondbacks. Uh, it's not necessarily meaningful to, to, to have to know the difference. If you see a, a rattlesnake and you can't positively identify it, um, it's not going to matter to you. Some of them have neurotoxins. Some of them don't. Some of them have a mix of different neurotoxins. None of these really translate into that a Mojave rattlesnake is going to be meaningfully more dangerous to you than, than a diamondback. In fact, it's the opposite. Uh, diamondbacks are larger. They have more venom. Um, a diamondback bite, bite is more dangerous in most cases than a Mojave bite. Once you get into higher elevations in the mountains, you can run into these. This is an Arizona black rattlesnake. You might notice that a lot of these names are not incredibly creative. <laughs> so, you know, it's a big Arizona. It's a, it's a rattlesnake in Arizona and it's black. So it's an Arizona black rattlesnake. Some of the locals, especially if you start getting up towards Payson, or if you go hang out up there at all, they will call them timber rattlesnakes, but they're not. Timber rattlesnakes are a real rattlesnake, but they are not found anywhere in, in the Western United States. We have these Arizona black rattlesnakes. Uh, they're again, pretty secretive. If you go to any of the, you know, that pepper sauce cave or up into the, anywhere you can see pine cones. As soon as you get up into that area, you can start running into these. Um, here's why people think that they are timber rattlesnakes. And you can see why. Uh, it's a black rattlesnake that lives in the woods. <laughs> so somebody could move here from the east and say, oh, I know this. It's a black rattlesnake that lives in the woods um, and be, be mistaken. Uh, they, you know, they are an entirely different thing. Um, not really dangerous. I mean, I'm not saying don't play with them, but uh, or you should play with them, but there's, they're not aggressive is what I mean. 
Uh, you have Gila monsters there. They are not a rattlesnake, but they get an honorable mention just because they uh, also have a lot of mythology associated with them. Um, and they are venomous. But a notable thing about Gila monsters is that there are no recorded bites that I can find any evidence of that are an accident. Meaning if you are bitten by a Gila monster, it is because you picked it up. That is good to know because it is very avoid. It's a very uh, uh, an avoidable thing. Uh, don't pick up Gila monsters, and there is no danger from them. So they are dangerous to you in the same way that a bottle of bleach is dangerous to you. If you have a tendency to drink bleach every time you see a bottle of it, then bleach is the most dangerous thing that's in your environment. Um, if you can resist the urge though to drink it, then it's it's not dangerous at all. Gila monsters are exactly the same way. If you have an urge to go and pick it up whenever you see it, then they can be dangerous to you. If you can resist the urge to pick them up, then there's no danger to you. So amazing things. It's actually a very uh, lucky thing. It's one of the coolest things that we have out here are these Gila monsters. I love seeing them. I've been fortunate to see a bunch of them this year. Uh, they are protected here. Um, they are not um, rare either. So there, there's that idea that they're, they're very rare. They're not. They're incredibly common. They're just not above the ground very often. They spend most of their life underground, sleeping away, waiting for the right conditions. If you do see one and uh, it becomes agitated, it's going to do this. It's going to show you the inside of its mouth, which has this black skin in it that is supposed to be terrifying to you. So just leave it alone. You're fine. This one's really giving it to me. This guy's about eight inches long too. He's a baby. These guys are in that same camp too. Uh, not dangerous unless you earn it. Coral snakes do live in your neighborhood. Uh, they are venomous. They are very venomous. And um, they're also harmless entirely unless you pick them up. They're a small snake. They only get to be about 18 inches long. Uh, and the only bites that really happen are on the hand or in the webbing of the hand. There, are, again, are no accidental bites that I can find any evidence for. Um, the bites are so rare that they actually, for a period of time, stopped making antivenom for it just because it's not something that you need to, to worry about. Uh, as homeowners, I would say that the biggest worry you have if you see a coral snake is something different. Coral snakes eat other snakes. That is what they eat. The types of snakes that they like eat primarily termite larvae. So if you see a bunch of coral snakes in your yard, you have termites. <laughs> so that's really the, the note there. They're really, they're not something that's going to hurt you. You know, just don't pick them up. Same thing. And they can't hurt you. Their, their actual defense is to fart and run away. That is a hundred percent serious. They make a, a sound out of the cloaca. that sounds like armpit farts. And then they try to escape using these colors to disorient the predator. So yeah, they, they literally fart and run away. So that's all they got. They're venomous, but you know, not a problem. So here is kind of the meat of this presentation. And I want to say that a lot of this might sound just kind of like trivia. These are things that, you know, if, if you're not interested in rattlesnakes, how is this relating to keeping you safe? It does because knowing how to respond appropriately to a rattlesnake, if you see one, can change the way you perceive that situation and change your, um, your behavior. And that's what we're trying to do here because the key to a lot of safety uh, advice with snakes and anything else really is to get you to be able to respond to it rationally. If you're not responding to it rationally, you're often putting yourself in danger. So this is kind of the way that we talk about this are through the, myth, the myths and the misinformation that's very common here. Even if you grew up in Arizona or Texas or someplace that has rattlesnakes around, there's going to be something in here that you learn. Um, the mythology of rattlesnakes is so um, prevalent over the, the actual uh, the actuality of it that you very seldom, even the, the longer you live in a place, it can also kind of work against you. The longer someone lives here and the more you have these experiences and see these snake stories come out, the harder it can be to... Um, to unravel those types of things. If someone just moved here from another country or moved here from New Jersey, almost the same thing. If you're moving to Arizona, um, they have an easier time feeling better about rattlesnakes than someone that grew up here. 
just because it doesn't set so much in. It's not part of your identity. It's not, you know, so there's a lot of tricks to it. So we're going to get into that. So the reason that we have so much misinformation about snakes is because we have a lot of people that see snakes. We have a lot of snakes here more than any other place. We have lots of people moving here from other places, retiring here um, and moving from the center of the cities to the outside where you can suddenly start seeing snakes. So what is on all of our social media accounts all the time, every day right now, rattlesnake sightings and a whole bunch of OMG, I'm moving away, kill it with fire, a bunch of stuff like that, right? It, those are not necessarily, those are not rational responses to it. These are emotional responses to something that is very, very common here. We have lots of rattlesnake encounters. So if they're that dangerous, then why aren't there just bodies of people littering the trails and the golf courses every day? Uh, why are, are, you know, why are, aren't they the leading, leading cause of death in Arizona if it's such a big deal? Um, and uh, that's, that's where you start to have to question your thoughts about these. If you are very worried, uh, you know, if I'm giving this presentation in person, one of the first questions I ask everybody, just so I can kind of read on the room and figure out how I'm going to be um, talking to people is who, who is very scared of snakes, raise your hand, that kind of thing. Because the thing I'm going to ask you to do is to kind of open up here and question, be able, able to question how you feel about them. The goal here also, in addition to keeping you safe, is to make you feel better about where you live. You live in an amazing place, in the foothills of the mountains, with desert all around. You know, there's a reason you, you bought your house where you, where you did. Um, and if, you, if part of that is anxiety about rattlesnakes, this is something that can really help you so you feel better about it. And whether or not somebody um, takes that in or not is often kind of the difference between whether you're a person that is able to question your beliefs and open up to new information and how well you can take that new information and, and challenge those beliefs. So uh, for some people, this works out really well. Some people doesn't, but you know, give it a shot. So why, why is it such a dramatic thing? Why, whenever somebody posts a picture of a, a snake, is it such a big deal? I get it. People are scared of snakes, but why are we scared of them? This is one of those factors. So whenever a snake is on TV or in a movie or on social media, it is portrayed through this kind of silly, <laughs> uh, silly format, right? So these are from movies. We know, we all know that this is ridiculous. We all know that this is not what, you know, this is, these are silly movie things, right? But this makes up the entirety of snakes portrayal in, in movies and in media. So just because you know that this is false does not mean that it is not stored in your head and in the back of your mind, whenever you see a snake on social media or in person, these are things that act like a lens that's going to change the way you perceive that encounter. So if you are subjected to a lifetime of this kind of stuff, and then suddenly you see a rattlesnake in your yard, the things that you're feeling emotionally at that time and the perception and the memory that you're going to have from it are not fed by what you're actually seeing. You're seeing that through a lens of a lifetime of this kind of stuff that will change everything about how you, you feel about it. Um, and even though you know this is false, it doesn't mean that it doesn't uh, stick in your brain. Uh, a good example of how that type of confirmation bias happens is when I when you are going to go car shopping, when you've decided that there's a type of car that you just said, this is the car for me, or maybe you just bought one, suddenly that car is all over the road. You see that car everywhere. And the reason for that is not because everybody came to the same conclusion to you and bought the same car that you did on the same day. It's because your brain is changing the type of information that you're saying, this is important. I'm going to hold it up in the forefront of my brain. This other stuff is not important. I'm going to put it in the back. Okay. You've been seeing those cars the entire time, but as soon as it became important to you, your perception of the world changes slightly. And how you deal with snakes is the same way. The more of this type of information that you have, the more stories that you hear from people, um, the more of those encounters that you see through that, that lens of fear, when you actually see a snake, it will change the way you see it. And that's a little bit hard for a lot of us to kind of uh, admit to ourselves is how bad our brains are <laughs> at things. 
Uh, another one is the media. Um, snakes are in the news all the time. Uh, I'm quoted in the news uh, very often. Um, and uh, I've been on uh, TV quite a bit. And the thing that's notable is how, uh, how almost never am I quoted properly. <laughs> They'll take my statement and just cut it in half. It's like they come up with the title of the story and then just find pieces to fit. Uh, a favorite one that I have is when they'll just come up with some, some, some nonsense and tell a story somewhere near the bottom of the article is we called a herpetologist to see if this is true. And he said, it's completely not, but you decide for yourself. That's kind of the way that our media is now, right? So um, one of these uh, the, uh, is a really fun one for me, just to, it points out how obvious this is. Drought might be causing a higher rates of snake bites in Southern California, right? They tell that story every single year that the drought is meaning that more rattlesnakes are out there than ever. That was the case until about two years ago when they had record rainfall. And then the same story came out, record rainfall might be causing higher rates of snake bites than ever before. So the story is an immovable object in the, in the media, but they just change how that works. Our version of it here in Arizona is that rattlesnakes are coming out earlier than they did the years before. It's never true. It's always coming out the, right at the same time. And that little note at the bottom of that of those articles is always the same. We called a local snake expert and he says it's not true at all, but you decide. This year, um, it's a little colder than normal. It snowed at my house in Cave Creek yesterday. So we're having a little bit of a delay, but you can count on these types of things to be coming out. Or if snakes come out right on time, you know, maybe next week there'll be more of them coming out. The news will still come up with the idea of well, snakes are coming out earlier than this year. So it's just, it's just fabricated. Uh, this other story, four-year-old girl survives rattlesnake attack. This is an example of another type of media that I see a lot, which is that they got the, the uh, facts correct in it, but the narrative is, is silly. So this is a story of a little girl that was playing in her backyard in Southern California. She stepped on a baby rattlesnake, um, you know, had to go to the hospital. It was a scary, painful experience. She survived. A lot of lessons can be told from that. But the story misses that opportunity and talks about a rattlesnake that stalked and attacked a little girl for some reason. They didn't talk about all the things they could do to prevent rattlesnakes in their yard or how to keep it from happening again, or maybe wear shoes when you're outside in snake season, all those things. They missed all that. They just talked about this nonsensical story. So again, even if you're not paying attention to this stuff, if you're not thinking about rattlesnakes and keeping bias in check, this is the information that you have in your head when you're out there and you you finally see a rattlesnake on a golf course, you see it through the lens of all this misinformation. So that can change it. And the biggest challenge to people like me that are trying to uh, educate people so you can be safe and feel okay about snakes are just the people that we know. If I say that a rattlesnake does not chase a person, that I am directly conflicting with a story that your uncle told. I uh, am, am potentially uh, conflicting with information, a story that you have, that an experience that you have that you can clearly see in your head of a snake chasing you. Well, I, and I believe that you have that memory, right? So this is where it gets really hard. And I'm asking you to kind of open up to, to some of this stuff. Um, the way that your memory works, the way that our brains work is not like, playing back a DVD where it's an exact replica of exactly what happened. When you are sensing something, when you're seeing something, you're hearing something, and then you record it in your head, and then 20 years later, you try to recall what happened there, you are not seeing exactly what happened. You are seeing your brain pulling bits and pieces of information to recreate that the best it can. The, when you recall something visually, it is not a direct recording of what happened is pieced together again. So it's like playing telephone game with yourself. Um, and if you need a good example of how bad our brains are at being reliable and that kind of thing, um, look up the history of eyewitness accounts in court and how eyewitness accounts used to be very important, but now it's kind of junk. It's junk evidence. And that's why there's all these, uh, the rules about why uh, police can interrogate people certain ways versus uh, other ways because they, you can implant and influence people's memories and they can say that they saw something 100% reliably, that they, that they remember that and they're not lying because they remember that. 
but also what they saw did not happen. Another good example of that are just um, optical illusions. When you are shown something that doesn't make sense, your brain says, well, I'll just fill in the gaps here and make sense of it for you. So the people that we know personally can come up with a lot of rattlesnake stories. We all know those, those individuals that kind of every time they go outside, they, they see Bigfoot riding a spaceship, caught the biggest fish in the world, but no one will believe them, that kind of thing. doesn't necessarily mean they're lying. It just means that um, they, uh, well, they're influential in your life. So all of these things together mean that when you see a rattlesnake out there, you are not going to, it is very unlikely you're going to be able to, to react to that snake just because of what it's doing. It's all this expectation. You know, when I ask people that are very scared of snakes, um, why are you scared of snakes? When did that start? They don't really remember. Well, I saw a snake once and it terrified me. Well, seeing a snake isn't a terrifying thing. It's all the expectation associated with that. The snake didn't do something that terrified that person that made them scared of snakes that lifelong um, for, forever. It is that they have learned or expected that snakes are an exceptionally dangerous thing. So when they see a snake, it is a very dangerous thing in their mind. And then that equates into fear, right? So uh, a good way to go through some of that misinformation and unwind some of that is just to go through some of the common myths that, that I hear every day that um, can make seeing snakes seem a lot more dangerous than they are. Uh, I'm going to answer a question quick from Ed too. He says, asked if, is it true that snakes come out when you start seeing small lizards? Um, not, not really. Um, it can be an indicator. Lizards will tend to come out any day that, uh, that the weather is nice. Snakes are not quite like that. They need to have more consistent temperatures when they really start coming out. So on a day when you see lizards, you can see snakes too, but seeing lizards, uh, I wouldn't say that's an indicator that you're going to start seeing rattlesnakes as well. Uh, there, there are other, you know, the thing that we look at that says that we're going to start seeing rattlesnakes out and about, it's mostly overnight lows. When you start seeing overnight low temperatures that stay in the upper 50s or low 60s for four or more days in a row consistently, then snakes say, okay, it's time to come out and do that. Lizards, they'll just kind of come out. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's an accurate one. So the top 10 myths, first of these is just the idea of aggressive rattlesnakes. This is what, and everybody, if you have family coming in town to visit and they're going to go hiking, they think this is going to happen. You're walking along Sabino, Sabino Canyon and a rattlesnake is just going to jump out of the desert and get you. This is the perception. And people also often ask me, what is the most dangerous, what's the most aggressive rattlesnake? Rattlesnakes are not aggressive. They are defensive. And that might sound like just kind of a semantic difference, but it's, it's really not. Um, a defensive animal is one that is trying to preserve its own life. An aggressive animal is one that come, goes out of its way to get you. If you're a mouse, rattlesnakes are very aggressive. They are the one that attacks you. If you are a person, a rattlesnake does not want that. Uh, this video, uh, if you can see it, it's a guy, uh, he's in Arizona somewhere, um, and he's doing what many people do when they see a rattlesnake, is that he's provoking it. Um, for whatever reason, I can only guess, it's, you know, it's an attention-seeking uh, vehicle, and, and we all know this. We all know this type of individual in our lives. We might be that guy that when they see a snake, we have to poke it with a stick or mess with it in some way or whatever. But this is a, a good representation of what rattlesnake's behavior actually is. This is a Western diamondback in the middle of the screen. It's raised in defense, trying to scare this guy away. And this guy is not listening to it. He's staying there. He's playing with it. He's messing with it. If this snake bit him, that is not a rattlesnake attack. This is not an aggressive rattlesnake. This is a rattlesnake that is being defensive and trying to keep this guy away. Um, if rattlesnakes were aggressive, if rattlesnakes chased people or jumped through the air, the snake would just kill this guy, right? Um, I would certainly be dead <laughs> many times over. If rattlesnakes chase after people and picked fights and were aggressive, the you wouldn't be able to go hiking in Arizona because it would be hard because you'd have to kick all the bodies off the trail as you go. There's so many rattlesnakes out there. If they had any inclination to attack people when they saw them, 
um, it would be a very situa different situation, but that is not the case. When you go hiking, you walk past rattlesnakes all the time. You just don't see them because they, their first defensive uh, line of defense is to stay hidden. If that doesn't work, then they might do this and stand up and try to do that. Um, so it creates this misconception that rattlesnakes are, are, are hyper aggressive things. A rattlesnake that is rattling at you is not a rattlesnake that is signaling that it's about to attack. A rattlesnake that is rattling at you is saying, hey, you didn't know I was here. Now you know you should back up because I have a weapon. And that's what this snake is saying to this guy and he's ignoring it. Here's another one. Uh, there is a type of snake that is in, in your neighborhood. They love golf courses uh, called a gopher snake. And king snakes are in the same camp too. They love golf courses. They're moving around a lot. Um, and they can look pretty intimidating. A gopher snake is not a rattlesnake. It is not harmful in any way. There are no fangs. There's no venom. If it bit you, it could cause some scratches and bleed. Uh, but they're not dangerous. And when someone tells me that they saw a snake and it opened its mouth and showed its fangs and was ready to strike or lunge, as they'll say, that tells me that they saw something that was not a rattlesnake. Rattlesnakes, when they're defensive, do not open their mouth as part of the defense. They keep their mouth closed and they'll hiss, but their mouth is closed. If a snake is going like this and opening it and gaping its mouth and hissing at you like that, um, it was a gopher snake that you saw. Um, uh, I also want to talk about the word lunge here too. When people ask about what is the strike distance of a snake, right? It is about half to two thirds of their body distance. Maybe a little more if they're on a hill or something. So a snake cannot jump at you. A rattlesnake can't jump at you. And that's just the reason why that can't happen. It's just physics. Um, a defensive strike is kind of like a jab. So a four foot rattlesnake, which would be the biggest one you're gonna see in your area, can really strike only about two and a half to three feet at, at, at maximum. For the same reason that I can't punch so hard that I go flying 10 feet through the air. There's no, nobody in the world can punch so hard that the momentum of that punch is going to make their body fly through the air like a comic book. Rattlesnake is the same way. There's, when they strike, there's pressure and force going in both directions that will equalize. So it's more of a straightening out of their body. So there's a maximum amount that can, that can, that momentum can carry them. They can't strike so hard that they, they jump. So um, if you're walking and a rattlesnake suddenly strikes at you, and you are more than one big step away from it, you are entirely safe. I would take maybe another step, right? But you know, the only situation that when a, you're actually in strike range would be if you are standing and it's suddenly just right at your feet, it's right at your toes. In that case, you know, people ask me, what weapons should I carry to defend myself against snakes? It's a nonsensical thought that, um, if you are standing within strike range of a rattlesnake, that you're going to be able to use a weapon faster than the, the obvious answer is just to take a step away from it. You don't have to run down the trailer and just take a big step away and you are good. If you have a dog, use your leash. If you're hiking and you don't have a leash, well, then you're, you're taking some risk, right? Um, so uh, here's a gopher snake acting defensively. It's triangulating its head. It's rattling its tail. It's actually not mimicking a rattlesnake. That's what a common belief. It's not, this is what snakes do. Rattles or snakes all over the world will rattle their tails. Rattlesnakes just evolved to get good at it. I'm, I'm intentionally provoking this snake just to show this defensive behavior. I can see how if you just moved here from New Jersey, you saw the snake in your backyard um, and don't worry about my shoe, it's fine. Um, Why well, you'd think that this is a really dangerous snake, this is a good guy. Uh, gopher snakes, they don't eat rattlesnakes. That's another myth, but they, they can potentially help compete with them just by eating rodents, that kind of thing. King snakes, the, the white and black banded ones, they do actually eat rattlesnakes. So anything that is not a rattlesnake um, is good to have in your yard. When he crawls away, you can see his tail, pointed tail, no rattle. Here's a really common myth that... Uh, really you have probably had no chance to not believe because I've seen this one repeated on the Discovery Channel and on Animal Planet and then the news and park rangers say this, the idea that baby rattlesnakes are more dangerous than adults. It is not true, just not true at all. This is a mother, Western Diamondback with her babies. 
a uh, couple different reasons why people think that this is the case. One of those is that they think that uh, baby rattlesnakes are much more toxic than uh, the adults are. And this can be true. Baby rattlesnakes can be more toxic than adults for a variety of reasons, but it's not meaningfully more toxic to a person compared to venom yield. Venom yield is how much venom they can potentially give you. The metaphor for that for adults is, is very easy. It's a shot of whiskey or a gallon of wine. Which of these is gonna make you sick after drinking it? Obviously the whiskey is a lot more potent than the wine, but you can have a shot of whiskey and you'll be fine. If you drink a gallon of wine, you, uh, no, you're not gonna be feeling great for a lot of reasons, right? Um, Rattlesnake's venom is kind of similar, is that uh, a little bit of very toxic venom is gonna be less dangerous in most cases than a lot of, of, a, of a less toxic one from an adult. And the difference between toxicity of a baby versus an adult rattlesnake is, 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 is this is hyperbolic. This is not, um, uh, not representative of that. It means that the, the more venom you get, the worse off you're probably going to be. And adults are always going to be able to deliver more venom. But the more common reason why people think that uh, baby rattlesnakes are more dangerous is because the myth is that they are not experienced enough to know how much venom they give you. So they always give you all the venom they have while adults might withhold some. So first off, um, when examined, there's just no truth to that at all. Rattlesnakes can exert, uh, they, they can control how much venom they're going to give you, and they can always do that. Um, and these studies that are here, this is not to, uh, I'm not expecting you to read this, and I'll have some more that I'm going to show later. This is basically just to say that this is not my opinion. This is based on peer-reviewed science, and if anyone wants more evidence of this kind of thing, let me know later. I'll be happy to email these, these studies. Um, it's an interesting thing is when somebody grows up thinking that baby rattlesnakes are worse than adults and they believe this for 50 or 60 years, when they learn that, oh, that's not true, it's not, whew, what a relief. I always thought the babies were worse. There's something about our personal identities that does that. So if you are feeling a little prickly right now about this reality that baby rattlesnakes are not worse than the adults, question yourself, are you feeling that because you have evidence that says something differently or because it's something you've always believed. And it, it's hard, hard to give that up sometimes. Um, you know, and I would say too, if you have a dog or something that was bitten by a baby rattlesnake and it was a bad bite, that is not evidence that babies are worse than, the, worse than adults. What you'd need to do is have your poor dog be bitten over and over again by different ages of rattlesnakes and then compare them to be able to do that. So baby rattlesnakes can give a very bad bite, but an adult rattlesnake has more venom and the bite ends up being much worse. So for homeowners, this is a, a, a fun one. Um, there are no snake repellents that work. If you have a pest control person that is selling you snake repellent, save yourself some money and cancel that service immediately. Um, I wish it worked. The way that I pay my mortgage and buy food for my family is to keep snakes away from people's homes. If there was something as easy as laying down a, a repellent to do it or laying down some mothballs or a rope or whatever, oh, that'd be great. I, I, you know, I'd be making a lot of money, it'd be easy, um, but it doesn't work. And the reason that we know it doesn't work is because we, you know, I have personally removed thousands of rattlesnakes from homes that have snake repellent all over the place. We don't see any difference at all between yards that are treated with snake repellents and, and yards that are not, other than the one with the repellent on it, smells like a cat box. Okay, so um, yeah, leave, leave that stuff alone. And it's not because your pest control guy is, is lying to you. Um, they were sold as well by the manufacturers. They have um, you know, the marketing, right? That tells you that this stuff works. You know, they're believing them. It, it doesn't work at all. Here's a rattlesnake sleeping in some mothballs. Uh, obviously not working. Here's a snake crossing a rope. Doesn't work. Um, this is my favorite one uh, single answer to when someone emails me to ask about um, 
whether or not snake repellents work. This is a, a photo that one of my crew took. It's a Western Diamondback rattlesnake sitting there uh, with some snake repellent. Uh, this particular person bought hundreds of dollars worth of this stuff and was just laying it all over the property. So much of it, that it was a two day job. So these are unopened bags, but there was a bunch of open ones too. And when the bags were removed to catch this, the snake moved into them overnight. Uh, I have seen rattlesnakes sleeping on top of piles of it. I have seen rattlesnakes sleeping inside bags of this stuff. So, you know, for, for whatever reason, just hang on a sec. Yeah, just don't, uh, don't buy it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so here's another fun one. If you're getting a gift shop or something like that, um, you can see these things, rattlesnake eggs, right? Um, so this is a fun one because this has something to, a lot to do with um, rattlesnake, um, you know, how that affects our minds, our behavior, right? And first, rattlesnakes don't lay eggs. Rattlesnakes give live birth. That's just the way that works. There's no rattlesnake eggs out there. But, well, here's a picture of that. This is a mother rattlesnake with all of her babies. Um, they give live birth and then they stay with the, the mothers or stay with the babies for a little while. It's actually kind of a useful thing if you're, if you're trying to get people to not be as scared of snakes. You can create a little bit of empathy here because uh, most people don't know that rattlesnakes are actually good mothers. They know their, their kids. It's an interesting thing. But where it gets interesting for me with the way that people perceive snakes um, are these. These are quail eggs. Okay. Quail um, are very common. They're in all of our yards, but there's something about the way that people perceive rattlesnakes that when they see some unidentified eggs that are out there, um, they skip over all the other types of birds that they see. They skip over all the different types of, of snakes that do lay eggs and all that. And they see this and they go immediately, well, these are 100% rattlesnake eggs. Can you please come help me and get these rattlesnake eggs out of my, <laughs> out of my yard? Um, so that, that just says a lot to me about um, the way that rattlesnakes occupy our minds. And that's not one call that we get. As soon as quail start laying their eggs, we're going to get, you know, many calls and emails every day about rattlesnake eggs. So there's a logical operation that happens here. Um, another example of this that you might see if you're into any kind of outdoor hiking or camping or you know, on Facebook groups or something like that or next door, whenever someone posts a picture of, of an unidentified paw print from an animal, it's always a dog, you know, it's always a dog's print, but what do they ask? Is this a mountain lion? I think it's a mountain lion. And then when people say, no, it's, it's not a mountain lion. It's a dog because of claws and this kind of stuff. Well, I still think it's a mountain lion. There's, there's a logical process there that is interesting to where people will consider the most unlikely, but most interesting or dangerous thing first, and then try to disprove it from there. As also why when you are wondering about how to identify a coral snake, you might've heard like a rhyme about red touching black, disregard that rhyme entirely. It is only not only accurate, not an accurate in Arizona, but what happens is people end up killing harmless snakes. They kill long nosed snakes. So they see, they said they saw a four foot coral snake. Um, that was a long nosed snake or something as well, because the logical process is that you look at the most unlikely answer first and then try to discredit it from there. And that's, that's going to leave you wrong all the time. So these quail eggs are a very interesting thing to me because they, they illustrate that so well. This is another myth. Baby rattlesnakes don't have rattles yet. Baby rattlesnakes do have a first segment of, of a rattle. Um, this guy is called a night snake. And if you're trying to identify a snake, you can start seeing, you know, some of these things um, are, uh, uh, the identifying characteristics that a lot of people errantly believe it has cat's eyes, it has a triangular head, those kinds of things. Other snakes can have those things too. Uh, a lot of snakes have heads that can be triangular. And then you start getting into that logical process problem I was just talking about is if you're looking at a snake, I think this is a rattlesnake until proven otherwise. A lot of heads that are kind of not quite triangular start looking, well, it's triangular enough. I'm going to go with rattlesnake. That can lead you wrong a lot. Night snakes are probably the most squished snake in, in Tucson because of this, because they look superficially like rattlesnakes. But the one thing you will notice is that their tail is pointed. There's no rattle on it. Rattlesnakes are born with a single segment of rattle. This is a newborn rattlesnake in this picture. This is 
uh, Western Diamondback, and you can see that segment on it, bright yellow, it is the, it's called a pre-button. That is the segment of rattle that they have when they're born. Um, if there's a genetic deformity, if something happens there, if there's an injury, um, it doesn't mean that, that there's gonna be a pointed tail. Uh, a pointed tail is actually a fairly complex structure. Um, it doesn't seem like it. it is not the default position for a snake without a rattle. There are rattlesnakes that don't have rattle, rattles in Arizona. There are occasionally ones that are born without, without a rattle, just like a person can be born without a hand. Um, occasionally there's an injury where a rattle doesn't form. It's still blunt at the end, it's still not pointed. And old rattlesnakes, aging rattlesnakes, can have a variety of different rattle sizes as well. Actually, I have some rattles here, let me show you. Um, Here's a rattle that's broken off. I'm not sure if you can see it really well, but this happens all the time. Rattles are made of the same stuff as your fingernails. So they get brittle in the sun, they fall off. So you can have an old rattlesnake cruising around that's 20 years old with no rattle. It doesn't mean it's a baby, it means that his rattle broke off. So um, don't rely on uh, pointed tail being a good indicator. So if you have uh, one of these in your hiking kit, these snake bite, it's extractors. REI still sells them, Walmart still sells them. I wish they didn't. Um, these do not work at all. The idea is that you're gonna be able to, if a rattlesnake bites you, you're gonna be able to suck the venom out and you'll be okay. Um, they don't work at all. If you have one of these, get rid of it. What they actually do is make the situation worse. If you are bitten by a rattlesnake, and I'll, I think I'll talk about this a little more later, but basically call 911. There's nothing else that you should do. There's nothing else that you can do. It is an internal injury. So just leave it alone. Don't try to help yourself do things. You know, if you, if you uh, injected yourself with bleach, there's no amount of rubbing the wound or something or cutting it that's gonna help. Don't use a tourniquet. Please don't, that's gonna make it worse. Don't try to suck the venom out. That's gonna make it worse. Call 911 and you have here in Tucson, uh, so the best treatment available in, in the country. So um, yeah, call 911, do what they say. If you do have one of these snake bite kits uh, in your backpack or something, um, I did make this video, which is the proper use for one of these things. You take it out and you throw it in there because it's garbage and doesn't work. So this is a myth that you may have been hearing. If you haven't been hearing it, then you're going to shortly. Um, at some point, it's a new one and it's fun for me because I get to watch how misinformation grows and, and grows new heads and spreads around the country. This idea that rattlesnakes are no longer rattling, uh, they're evolving to, to not rattle anymore because of whatever reason, right? Um, it's not true at all. You may experience rattlesnakes evolving less, or not evolving, but rattling less later in your life. That is uh, not because rattlesnakes are evolving to rattle less, it's because you got better at seeing rattlesnakes. So if you remember when you were a kid and all the rattlesnakes seemed to rattle all the time, every time you saw a rattlesnake, but now later in life, you see a rattlesnake hiking and this is sitting there. Confirmation bias is a thing that can play there to where you say, huh, okay, I just saw something in the news that says that rattlesnakes don't rattle anymore. This rattlesnake is not rattling, so that must be true. It's not, what's really happening there is that uh, you just got better at seeing rattlesnakes with experience. So you, early on, you tended not to see them until the rattlesnake had an encounter with you and it was a more explosive thing where the rattlesnake style you first, but now you're better at seeing them. So over time you can have that experience. Um, in populated areas, around golf courses, around homes, rattlesnakes may not rattle as much as they used to. It's just because they're used to people. They see people coming all, all going all the time. Their response to that is to not rattle as much. If you take that snake out of that environment for a period of time, they will start, they'll lose that. It's basically a stress response thing. It's a well-documented thing. Um, so it doesn't mean they're evolving to do that, uh, but rattlesnakes that live at a golf course very well may not rattle as much as, as other rattlesnakes. It's just because they, if they rattle at every golfer they saw, they would never get anything done because that's all they'd be doing. They just say, oh, it's another golf cart. Don't worry about it, I'm fine. Um, this is a, an interesting one, again, that has to do with more with people than rattlesnakes, this idea of giant rattlesnakes. Some of you have, may have seen some of these photos. I have seen these photos many hundreds of times, all of them emailed to me, 
in almost every one of them, this interesting thing happens. The person emails it to me, says, look at this snake that my coworker killed, or look at this picture I took when I was hunting. So that couldn't have happened because these are all, you know, each of these, I get the same photo over and over again with somebody that attaches their story to it. So when someone's telling you snake stories, realize that rattlesnakes are a very interesting thing. It's an easy way to kind of, it's a good vehicle to, to tell somebody something about yourself. I'm an outdoorsman, I'm creative, I'm interesting, something like that. Who knows? Who knows what it is? But there is a psychological aspect to it. These are all Western di- or Eastern diamondback rattlesnakes. And none of them are as big as they look. The one that's being held up by the pole uh, um, on the uh, right, that is a, an, an Eastern Diamondback. It was last reported um, at 15 feet long and 197 pounds. Um, it wasn't. It was maybe six feet long, maybe five or six pounds. Um, the last time I actually saw this, somebody from Tucson sent it to me, ignoring the fact that the sheriff's car in the background said, uh, Dade County in Florida, on it, right? So um, there's this, people love to tell stories. Rattlesnakes are a good way to do it. The one in the middle, that snake was reported in the news as eight feet long, or I've seen 15 feet long as well. The guy that is actually holding it up even said, yeah, this snake was not that big. I don't know. They're holding it towards the camera. That snake was maybe four and a half feet long. And then the other one on the end, that's another recent Diamondback. People have reported it in Montana and East, in, uh, Washington, all these different places where Eastern Diamondbacks don't live, again, they just make the news over and over again. That snake might have been five feet long, maybe. Um, The reason why they look so big is just this. It's called forced perspective. It's just when things are larger or when things are closer to you, they look bigger. Uh, For some reason, the subject matter makes you forget that. If I hold up my cell phone, right, and, and, and you took a picture of that, no one's going to go, why is that guy's cell phone three feet tall? Why is that guy carrying around a, a cell phone that's so big? It's obvious to you that what's happening just because it's closer. But when it's a snake, your perception changes. So look at these pictures again, knowing that. All this is, these are just snakes that someone's holding towards the camera. They're not that big. So a monster rattlesnake in Arizona is four feet long. If you think you've seen one that is 10 feet long, or you think that you've seen one that is 12 feet long or 20 feet, and people have reported all those things, um, that is perception and memory and a lot of things messing with you. Um, And they couldn't exist that big. Uh, Part of the reason for that is just their their structure. Um, It's like saying that you saw a 30 foot tall horse and then having the evidence of that, well, you weren't there, I was there, I saw a 30 foot horse. If you had a 30 foot horse, that horse would crumple under its own weight and die, right? So um, there are reasons for that. The reason I'm showing this picture from the Lord of the Rings too, is that you're, you're familiar if you've seen these movies with forced perspective, the way they constructed these sets is that, you know, it wasn't computers is that they made them um, so that the little guys were further away than the big guys. That's all that is. So um, when you are scared of something too, it can, pers- it can change your perception. Um, this is really well documented with spiders and other phobias. If you see something, you can remember it as larger than it was, which means, uh, and also that it's moving differently and faster and, and uh, closing distance and your perception of time changes. Your memories are recorded or the memories that you have come from your perceptions, not from what's really there. So you can get to these situations where you can clearly remember a 10 foot rattlesnake chasing you. I believe you absolutely that you remember that happened, but also that didn't actually happen. We measure some of these things just in our own education events where we have uh, a a rattlesnake. We did this for a number of years. It's a 46 inch long Arizona black rattlesnake, almost four feet, very big snake. And we asked people that were looking at it to tell us how big the snake is. And we had them write their answers down on a piece of paper and put it into a box. We got hundreds of responses. And those responses, uh, you know, they could use a dollar bill or measuring tools or look at it as much as they want to try to get the right answer here. And we got answers between 18 inches and 20 feet and all the answers in between there. So people are just not very good at at estimating size. It's just a thing that we tend, there's some Dunning-Kruger effect there. Um, Look that up if you 
aren't familiar with Dunning-Kruger effect, um, but we just overestimate our abilities to judge size. Confidence and then the interesting nature of the topic mess with that as well. If, if someone, you know, you saw a piece of rope on the ground and then 10 years later or asked to recall how big it is, your answer might be like, well, I don't know. Why, why six feet long, two feet long? I don't care. It's rope. But if it was a rattlesnake, those answers change very drastically. It was four feet and 10 inches long. I know that exactly. You don't question me. It was my experience. I was there. You weren't. I grew up across the street from a Home Depot. I know all about rope. So those differences can be there. So when you have somebody that's in your personal life that says, yeah, I saw a 12 foot long rattlesnake when I was out hunting, they didn't. But you, it doesn't mean that they're lying. It's a very complicated thing. And fear plays a big part in our the way our perceptions are. So this is a, this is a, one that uh, a lot of people won't agree with me on. But you know, this is not based on the fact that I like snakes. Um, this is for homeowners. If you kill rattlesnakes that are at your house, you are not actually making the area more safe. You are not actually presenting uh, a more safe situation for yourself either. Um, and there are some, some good reasons for that. This is based on our data. Um, that we have collected over uh, well over 10,000 rattlesnake encounters at people's homes, where people encounter rattlesnakes, and what effectively actually keeps rattlesnakes away from those homes and what makes you more safe. Killing rattlesnakes doesn't do the trick. Okay. Um, here's again another study. This is one that shows how stress affects the behavior of rattlesnakes. So if you live in an area, which you do, where rattlesnakes are common and show up at homes, and there are resources there, if there's something at your house that a rattlesnake finds useful. Golf courses are very useful to rattlesnakes because there's prey there and there's water there. The bushes around the edge of the golf course is a very incredibly useful thing. If the people that are running that golf course killed the rattlesnakes that they show up, as they show up, um, all they're doing is perpetually introducing new snakes that are going to come in and try to use that environment. When I was saying earlier about how rattlesnakes have modified their behavior to not care anymore about certain things, and that's why they don't rattle anymore in a lot of those situations, it's because those snakes are experienced. Those snakes have learned how to avoid you. They learn that, okay, this person's dog comes out every day at six o'clock in the morning. I want to avoid that. So I'm going to stay hidden for that situation. We see a, a, a massive um, change in those behaviors with the snowbirds when people are seasonal residents. When they come into town, suddenly they see a whole bunch of rattlesnakes and call us, help, there's rattlesnakes everywhere. And we go there and find that the rattlesnakes have always been living there. But the only thing that has changed was that the homeowner left. And the snakes change their behavior because the predators, from their perspective, the stressing elements are no longer there. So if you live in an area where rattlesnakes are, you, there are rattlesnakes there. They're, they are there. So your choice is, do you want rattlesnakes that are there that are experienced, that know to avoid you, that know that your backyard is not really is a good place to hang out, that know that you have a dog, that know that the car coming and going from your driveway is not a thing that's going to go away? Or do you want snakes that perpetually show up and are surprised by your presence? That's the difference between those things. Um, a, a statement that people give me sometimes that I think it's kind of funny, but it illustrates this is when... Somebody says, when they kill a rattlesnake on their property, I kill five or six rattlesnakes on my property every year, and I'm going to keep doing it because it's working great for me. works for me. If you kill five snakes on your property every year, it is clearly not working, right? What's that definition of crazy? Uh, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. The, the smarter way to approach this, if you have rattlesnakes on your property, is to look procedurally at what is causing them to show up. Why are they there? What can be changed on your property that can keep rattlesnakes away? What can be changed in your behavior that can make it so that those encounters are less dangerous? Those kinds of things. It's like if you kept garbage on your patio and every time you swatted a fly, you said, well, that's it. Last fly I'm ever going to see without ever realizing you need to take out the trash. And that's, that's much more likely. Um, and also just by killing them, by approaching them, you end up over and over again, joining this special club of people that intentionally interact with something that 
does not need to be interacted with. Uh, this is a screenshot that I took just at the time that I made this presentation of these are people that were killed by venomous snakes. And there's a trend. I'm just going to read the first line of these. Let's see if we notice that trend. While camping at this park, Levins walked outside, saw a snake brought it to his son's attention. When he picked it up, the snake bit him. Coots was bitten on the right hand while at his service at his church. There's services, there's churches that handle rattlesnakes as part of that. Um, all those people die eventually. It's not because snakes are mean, it's because you're picking up snakes. Uh, Wolford was bitten on the thigh while handling a timber rattlesnake as part of his outdoor religious service. He died. Westbrook was bitten, bitten above the right elbow while handling a copperhead while he was trying to determine the snake set sex. He died. The last person in here, he's bitten above the right ankle while wading across a river in California. So the point of this is not that rattlesnakes are not potentially dangerous. The point is, do not go walking into that danger for, for no reason. It's not actually helping you. It's, it is the, the most dangerous thing you can do if you see a rattlesnake. If there's a rattlesnake that's over there, it's 10 feet away from you and you see it and it's rattling you, no matter how it's acting, there is no danger to you whatsoever unless you choose to go over there and interact with it. If you saw a person walking down the street that looked crazy carrying a machete, is your first instinct to go hit him with a shovel? It's not. You call the cops. You call someone else. You go back inside and wait till he goes away. With snakes, there's something about it, something with our culture and our identity that says, well, I got to do something else. I got to defend my house and defend my property. I have to go engage in the most dangerous and unnecessary behavior I possibly can to go do this. And if you don't do that, then you're a coward. It's a weird line of reasoning, but it's something that a lot of us feel. Um, you know, if you had a hive of bees at your house, do you go in and start, you know, hitting it with a shovel? It's kind of the same thing. These are choices you can make. So what can you do? Actually, I'm going to go into these numbers a little bit too. These, it starts getting a little bit sillier when it starts looking at it. Uh, uh, how dangerous are rattlesnakes at your property? Um, so in Arizona, there are between two and 400 or so bites each year in the state. So this is in the state that has the highest uh, growth rate in the country of new people, of new developments in areas where there are the most rattlesnakes in the country and the most uh, diversity and density. So more rattlesnakes here than anywhere in the country, more people moving here, anywhere in the country, all those things come together, nobody is dying. Nobody dies from rattlesnake bites. So why are we all so worried about it? Okay, uh, in the last 10 years in the United States, I think this is actually 27 now, but 25 snake bite deaths in the United States in a decade. Okay, that includes people that have pet cobras. That includes um, a young person that killed themselves by holding a venomous snake to their chest and those snake handlers and people that do dumb things. So it's really not something that needs immediate intervention in the way that we often tend to, to want to do that. Um, uh, interesting statistic that is true, more people are hurt or killed when they're shooting at a snake and miss and accidentally shoot somebody or themselves, then rattlesnakes kill. This is a really uh, compelling uh, example of the, the cure being worse than the, the, the problem, right? Um, and only one snake bite death residence that was caused by a snake in 15 years in the country. And you can guess how this happened. A fire marshal went to help a neighbor who spotted a rattlesnake while he was mowing his grass. He shot at the snake. It went under a shed and he was bitten when he reached for it. So not only is killing a rattlesnake that shows up at your property, not helping you prevent the next rattlesnake from showing up. Let's say your dog got built, bitten by a rattlesnake and was killed by it. Killing snakes as you go forward is not going to erase that. And it's also not going to prevent more rattlesnakes from showing up. Um, and also by doing so, you are, you are, you are uh, purposefully entering the most dangerous interaction you can get. And even then, why does it need such uh, aggressive intervention when it is really one of the least dangerous things uh, there? It feels very dangerous, but is it actually dangerous? It's really not. Uh, these are your typical snake bite, bite victims. They contribute to those 27 deaths. So if you are really worried about rattlesnakes, if you are questioning your decision to retire in Arizona, uh, 
saying that, okay, it's March, snakes are out. I'm not going to go hiking or golfing anymore. Then you should also be very terrified of these uh, menaces. Falling out of bed kills hundreds of times more people in the United States each year than rattlesnakes do, as do falling coconuts. High school football kills, you know, this is compared to zero to two deaths in the country. The country each year of venom, all venomous snakes. In Arizona, zero deaths. It's very rare for someone to die in Arizona from a rattlesnake bite. All of these things are very surprising to me. Uh, vending machines. So compared to zero to two deaths, uh, zero people in Arizona die from rattlesnake bites each year. 13 people on average in the United States die because a vending machine fall, fell on them. But when you see a vending machine, your first response is not to go hit it with a shovel. You know, go, go get the shotgun. I see some snacks. That is not your, re your reaction. Or, I hope not. Right. So, you know, all this stuff goes to try to, if you are really scared of snakes, try to question a little bit. What are you so scared of? You know, question Christmas shopping. Uh, kills a couple of people each year, except for less last year. This wasn't happening, but we had other problems. So for homeowners, all that being said, what can you do to make it so that you see fewer rattlesnakes in your yard? You want to be thinking procedurally. If there are a bunch of snakes in your yard, they are there because there's something that is important there. It's part of their range. It is part of their territory. And snakes are territorial in the same way that we are territorial. I have the place that I live. I have the place that I go to work. I have the place where I get coffee in the morning. I have a place I like to go have a drink at the end of the day, on the weekend. I have a place to go grocery shopping. Those places are my territory and you have a territory and your territory is going to look slightly different than your neighbor's territory. All of us have these, a memorized map in our head of places we like to go. For a snake, your yard might be one of those spots too. If my favorite coffee shop closed down, I'm not going to be like, well, I guess I'm never going to have coffee again. I'm going to find another one. And my home range, my territory will be slightly modified because of that. So if you have things that are attracting snakes in your yard, you can get rid of those things and you can effectively modify the territory of those snakes. I don't think anyone here is going to mind if there's a rattlesnake that visits an area 20 feet outside of your fence. If they're on your patio, though, then that's a different situation. So these yards are Arizona yards, typical Arizona yards that look maybe like your yard. They have some of the, the common features that come pre-installed with a lot of the new builds here um, being lantana, rock, and rosemary. Those plants are some of the biggest offenders. So um, if you have lantana in your yard, that is one of the biggest attractants to rattlesnakes that I see at people's homes. We remove rattlesnakes from them constantly. The reasons for it is not because rattlesnakes like flowers, it's because lantana tend to be overwatered and under-maintained. Um, they provide shelter for them when it's hot. They hold moisture really well, so it's a good place for them to go. Rodents nest in them. The proper maintenance of a lantana, if you have it, is if you can look, if stand above it and look down directly over it, if you can see bare earth under it or bare rock under it, then that is a properly maintained lantana. If you can't see that, then there's too much stuff there. Uh, and you should, can, should consider uh, either getting rid of it or changing the way that it's maintained. Leaf litter at the bottom of plants is a big problem. So just like, uh, um, you know, heat, oxygen, and fuel makes a fire. Landscaping problems, shelter opportunities, and water and, uh, and food create opportunities for rattlesnakes. So if you're feeding the bunnies or you have a bird feeder out there, you're attracting birds and the animals that are going to, to come and eat them. So if you have a bird feeder and you wonder why you keep, why you keep having rattlesnakes there, it's because you're leaving free food out for them. So if those go hand in hand, there's not a situation where you're gonna have a bird feeder out there and not have rattlesnakes come and you know, another predators try to come in and eat the free food that's out there. If you leave a cheeseburger on your front porch, that might attract me to come and hang out at your house. If you left a cheeseburger out on your patio every day, hoping that I don't show up to try to get it, you'll be wrong. It's the same thing with bird feeders and feeding the bunnies and that kind of thing. So stop doing all that stuff. Shelter, um, common place that we see rattlesnakes at homes are places that are seldom visited, but uh, under maintained meaning your pool equipment area. There's a reason why there's a little retaining wall around those pool equipment, the pool pump areas. It's because 
you know, people don't want to look at it, which means it's often ignored. This is where you have the, most of the rodent problems on your property are going to be uh, rodents digging underneath that. These also become the place like the default storage for old pool toys and um, roofing tiles that, uh, that you don't want to look at. They're extra. Get rid of all that stuff. The pile of, of construction debris on the side of your house that's been sitting there for three or four years, get rid of it. Um, you know, every house has, has that, you know where it's at, at your place. That part of your yard where you store the stuff that you'll get to next time, uh, get to it this time. Get to it right away because those are all things that snakes can use to stay out of the sun. They don't like the sun. I mean, they like it in some places, but they die very easily in the heat. So if you are creating a lot of opportunities for them, they're going to come use it. Seal the garage door. Don't leave the garage open on a nice spring day. Anything that a snake or an animal can use, they're, they're going to come and use. Um, and then water opportunities. You know, there's a lot of pools. Snakes will come and drink out of a pool. There's not a whole lot you can do about that. But you don't need to give other sources of water. So uh, leaky garden hoses, that's a big thing. If your garden hose is dripping water, it's not like they can come and really drink out of it, but it makes a wet patch on the ground that attracts animals. It's cooler, a uh, place that they can get cool. It smells like algae and smells like things that can attract wildlife um, and rodents. So rodent control is snake control. It's the same thing. If you have a rat that lives 100 feet off your property and it's running around and it knows that it can come get a drink out of uh, your gardening and it comes in, it is laying an invisible scent path on the ground like a runway that a snake that is also crawling 100 feet off your property can detect and go, oh, there's a rodent. And he, where he goes every day is to this house. So that snake will then follow that in there and set up an ambush point right next to where that rodent is coming for food or water or for shelter. So if you can prevent rodents from visiting your property by not giving them opportunities, then you're also going to prevent rattlesnakes from showing up to look for those opportunities as well. So again, rodents, leaky hoses, any kind of brush or debris. If you need to keep something there long-term, move its location. Um, firewood is a good example of this. You, everybody's, you know, if you have a fireplace, you might be storing firewood at your house. Change the location of your wood pile every year. It doesn't have to be much. Move it 10 feet away. Move it to the other side of the wall. So you don't end up with these persistent long-term um, places where things can go. Put it elevated off the ground. Get one of those, um, those holders that elevates it off the ground a few inches. You're going to see fewer. Um, rock piles, if you have riprap or any kind of decorative rock pile, make sure that it does not, it's not deep. Um, if you have drainage and it's only like one, it's all those like orange to cantaloupe sized rocks and it's only one rock layer deep, that's fine. A rattlesnake can't really use that. But if it's two feet deep, they love it. Uh, in a lot of communities, um, a really popular way, especially newer ones, uh, of dealing with erosion control around drainages is they have all these piles of rocks. If you live near those, snakes are going to use those. Snake uh, Houses on the corners especially are going to have more, rattle, more rattlesnakes than other places. Um, control your garage, make sure that, you know, uh, if there's any kind of seal problems on it, get that solved. Easiest way to tell if you have a seal problem, look in the corners. If there are little leaves, mesquite leaves and dust and stuff that blew in there, it's blowing in because there's a seal problem. Contact a garage door company and ask them to replace the seal. Um, any under house access, that includes under sheds or buildings. If you see that there's any kind of digging or anything that goes under the house, get that sealed up right away. Don't let it become a problem. Uh, and access to the property itself. So you get rid of all this stuff. You can still have snakes that are gonna show up, or rattlesnakes that are gonna show up um, randomly just crawling through. If you live next to the golf course, if you live between the golf course and open desert, then you're kind of in the, in the path. We have, a, we have one client that we, we visit this house every two weeks just to kind of monitor it and we get snakes a lot. And he's doing everything just right. It's just that his house is between the golf course and the and the uh, the desert, so the snakes are moving back and forth across there. So things you can do to keep snakes out of those areas are uh, barriers. So um, this is a rattlesnake fence. This is something that we do. Other people do it as well. Um, it's made of quarter inch size mesh to seal the entire property so that rattlesnakes can't get into it. Um, 
so that if you do all these things together, basically try to, to look at your property critically to see what things you can do to make it so snakes are not being attracted to it actively and then change the nature of the property that snakes that are coming there um, can't get access to it, then you're going to have a much better time living here. So um, there's a lot of details about this snake fencing that, um, you know, if you want to, you can contact me. I can answer them. I definitely don't want this to turn into a, a commercial for our company. But um, if you are looking for that kind of thing, just make sure to use somebody that is uh, a licensed contractor that knows about snakes. That's all I'll say. Um, and again, don't buy any repellents. Repellents don't work. I wish they did. Don't buy mothballs, ropes, that kind of thing. doesn't work. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and post them in the chat. If you um, think of them later, you can email. If there's something that you want to talk to more in depth, you can email us. If you see a snake and you want to know what it is, that's one of the things that we do. Um, that's my cell phone number on there, actually, on the report sightings. You can text me at any hour and I'll tell you what it is. Uh, if I don't want to be contacted, I turn my phone off. So don't worry if it's two in the morning and you see a snake in your garage, you can text me a picture of it. Um, and if you like what we do, you can leave a review for us. If you feel like doing that kind of thing, it helps us so we can reach more, more people. Um, I don't see any questions um, on here. So um, that's it. I really appreciate, uh, oh, somebody raised a hand. Let's see how that. Let's see, Pam and Lynn, can you type it into the question and answers panel or into chat? I just don't have it configured for the talking part. Or we can try it. If you want to try this out, let me see. I'm going to click the allow to talk button. Oh, there we go. How high does snake fencing need to be? At least 30 inches, preferably 36. Um, the way that we have tested that is by um, we built a box and we did a lot of testing by putting different sizes of rattlesnakes into that to see how high they can climb up. They basically can climb up about half their uh, body length plus a small buffer and a 30 inch fence is gonna keep out a four foot rattlesnake. If you do 36 inches, that can keep up to a five foot rattlesnake up there. So that's our preferred. If you have a two foot snake fence, which happens sometimes, uh, I don't know what the CCNRs say for your community. Um, so if it says less less than 36 inches, um, we can you know, maybe we can work with them to um, to uh, to amend that. But uh, the 18 inch or 24 inch ones, uh, adult rattlesnakes have no problem climbing over. Unfortunately, do snakes eat lizards and the little geckos? Uh, they do, especially baby ones. But I wouldn't say that having lizards around your property is a thing that's going to attract rattlesnakes. Uh, it's mostly rodents. Rodents are the big thing. So if you have lizards on your property. That's totally okay. I wouldn't worry about them at all. Okay. So if a snake doesn't strike, unless it's next to my foot, why is a snake lunge important? Um, well, it's just a question people ask a lot. So if a snake is far away from you, if it's outside of its strike range, it might try to strike at you, but it's not, it's not gonna come, it's, it's not gonna come, like it's not gonna reach you. I see that common lot of the snake look, it was posed and ready to strike. Well, it doesn't really matter if it strikes because if you're outside of its striking distance, it, it just looks scary. That's it. So the only way that a snake is, is going to strike and connect with you is if it is uh, within that strike distance, which is pretty close. So just if a snake, if you see that you're standing right next to a snake, take a big step away from it, you're fine. Um, that's all. And don't do it slowly. That's the thing I see people say too is, you know, if you hear a snake rattling and it's right next to you, freeze and walk away slowly. Do not. Uh, a rattlesnake is a pit viper. It's not fooling it. You're not fooling anyone by moving slowly. They can see you very clearly. Um, so it's if it's rattling, it's saying, get away from me right now. It's not saying, please back up slowly. So take a big step. If you don't know where the rattling has come from, go back the direction you came. If my dog is sniffing a bush with a rattlesnake, is it likely to get bitten? Potentially. Um, so where dogs are bitten, it's usually on the face. It is usually happening after the rattling starts though. So if a dog is sniffing a bush and it's bitten, most often the snake still gives a warning. Not always, but the snake will start to, to uh, rattle. If you have control of your dog, you can, you can pull the dog back right then. Uh, I would say if you hike with your dog, do not hike without a leash. 
you know, it might be more enjoyable for the dog, but dogs are killed very often. Dogs that are hiking um, off leash are much, much more likely to be killed in a variety of ways than dogs that are off, uh, that are on a leash. So I get it. Your dog has good recall and all that, but also your dog's life is in danger if you're hiking without it. Um, there is rattlesnake aversion training. Um, there's a, a gentleman in, in Tucson named Steve Reeves, uh, who we don't, we don't have any business affiliation with or anything like that. I just, I just think he does a good job. I would contact him about that training. It, it definitely helps. Um, and yes, uh, snake bites can kill dogs. Um, there is, there's also a, a vaccine available. Um, and I'm not a vet, so I'm not going to give you any veterinary advice, but I would tell you that for me, for my, my dog, I would not get the vaccine because a couple things, uh, one vets have not seemed to come to any consensus of whether it works or not. So that's why I would not do it for my dog. Uh, I have, I'm aware of cases where dogs have died after a rattlesnake bite because of an allergic reaction that they had to the bite, um, that was sourced from they, they got it from the, the vaccine. So the vaccine made them so that, um, it gave, it made it so they were susceptible to allergic reactions and the dog died. And then there's also the unfortunate use of the word vaccine when it is not where people, uh, I've seen people that, uh, their dogs and horses, um, have died because they have the false belief that um, the, the vaccine is protecting them and they have more time than they do. They don't. So for my dog, I would not give that to him. Okay. I'm a little confused about the bite incidences. If I'm walking and don't see the sink until I'm next to it, then is it likely to bite? Uh, no. Um, if you see the, if you're walking along and then suddenly you look down and there's a snake at your feet, take off, take a big step away. If you're walking down and a rattlesnake is suddenly rattling at you and you're right next to it, it, it could bite, but more often than not, you have, you have time to, you know, react and, and jump away from it, take a big step away from it. So if you're walking around, it is something that can happen, but it is very unlikely that you're walking around and a rattlesnake just bites you out of nowhere. It does happen. Um, but it, and it feels like it happens more often than not, because even here in Arizona, we have so many people and in snakes, whenever that does happen, it's still the front page of the news. If there's accidental bites, accidental bites do happen, but they account for fewer than a hundred typically bites per year in our state with this many people, the number of people that hike and hunt here and golf here with all these snakes and fewer than a hundred accidental bites. It is not something that, um, you need to excessively worry about, especially if you are watching where you're going and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, if you're walking and you don't see a snake until you're almost right next to it, you're standing right next to it. As soon as you notice it, whether because it rattles at you or not, take a big step away from you, uh, from it and you, you'll be okay. Um, it's not saying that it can't just bite you out of nowhere or that that never happens, but it's not the, it's not worth worrying about too much. It's, it's an unlikely situation at homes at your home. That means, using a flashlight if you're going out at night and wearing shoes. Um, if you are worried about rattlesnakes, don't take the trash out at night barefoot without a flashlight. Accidental bites happen that way occasionally that can be prevented by doing those things. First thing I did when I bought my house out in the desert where rattlesnakes are is I put a little shelf next to every door that goes outside where there's a flashlight that lives there. And that's a rule in our house. If you go outside, you have shoes on, and you're using a flashlight and that can cut down those bites dramatically. Hopefully that answers your, your question, Pam. Can rattlesnakes hear? I think I heard they don't. So rattlesnakes, um, they do not have external ear openings. They can sense vibrations, but uh, it is not a sense that they use really the same way that we do. Um, so can they hear? They kind of can, but it's not something that uh, is meaningful to them. You know, a, a, an example of that is when people are, are hiking and they, they say they're going to uh, hit the ground with a stick or stomp with a heavy step while they're going, and that should scare off rattlesnakes as they're going. That doesn't work at all. Uh, in fact, even if snakes did sense vibrations to that extent from such a distance that you, it would happen before you got there, the first thing that they're most likely going to do is hold in place because their camouflage is their first line of defense. Uh, an example is when people see a snake and it's stretched out on a trail and people say, oh, it's sunning on the trail. 
It's not. The snake was crossing the trail and saw you and froze. And as soon as it gets out of, uh, uh, as soon as you leave, it's going to resume. Um, when we have people that have called us for, for snake removals, um, we ask them to sit and watch the snake and have a staring contest with it. It's not because we think that, that they, you know, we need their help to see it. It's because we know from a lot of experience that if you're looking at the snake and it looks like it's sleeping and you go inside to get a drink and come back 30 seconds later, the snake is gone. It's hiding because it took the opportunity to hide from what it thinks is a predator. If you have a snake in your yard or on your patio, should you try to coax it away? Um, you can. Um, in most cases, you know, I would say I wouldn't inter interfere with the snake at all by yourself. Call somebody to, to do that. Uh, if that what, what needs to be done, a garden hose can do that. Don't approach it to, to hit it with a stick or throw pebbles or anything like that. Sometimes you can cause a worse problem, uh, meaning if the snake is sitting on your, your patio, it may just be there overnight or it, it was there overnight and now it's daytime. So it's, it's going to be there for the day and then at night it's going to leave. Um, if you interact with it, then it might just, it might freak out and try to go hide somewhere. So then you had a, a situation that was controllable that is no longer under control. So I would, I would not advise that most people should interact with, with any snake that, that is there. Um, it's hard because it feels like you have to do something. But the fact is, if there is a rattlesnake and you see it and you know where it is, your the safest course of action a lot of times is just to let it do its thing and let it leave when the time comes, and it will. Um, and then try to really look critically at the situation. Again, going back to what people tell me all the time is, well, here's – I have to kill five or 10 rattlesnakes by my shed every year. I see them all by the shed all the time. They tend to be over here in this area. Look critically at the places that you tend to see rattlesnakes and what can be done to change that. Um, and you can call, you know, we remove rattlesnakes. There's other organizations that do that. So um, just Google it if you need someone to do that. If someone does come and catch a snake at your property, um, ask them all the questions about why the snake is there. So that the goal is it's not just to, to get rid of the snake, it's to figure out why it's there so you can prevent that. Uh, I, would, I would caution against, I wouldn't say using the fire department uh, to come and catch a snake is a good idea. It's not because I don't like firefighters and you know, I absolutely appreciate firefighters, okay? Um, but snake removal is, it's a thing that they do, but it's not a thing that they're necessarily um, skilled or qualified to do. Uh, because putting a snake into a bucket and capturing it, that's easy. What to do with it afterwards and to release it into a place that the snake is going to survive but and not panic and come back to your yard or come back into the neighbor's yard, that is a, a harder thing. That's a, a trickier thing. And, um, you know, you need to have the, the right knowledge of their natural history to be able to do that. kind. Of thing. So, all right. Last call for questions. I'll give it about a minute. And while I'm uh, waiting to see if any more questions come in, um, I'll say, you know, we are we are just about to come into uh, snake season. Snakes are uh, going to start becoming a big part of our social media feeds, and we're going to start seeing them around. Um, uh, if you learned anything in this presentation, you know, I, I hope that the takeaway can be that if you are really scared of snakes and it's been a big thing that causes you a lot of anxiety about where you live, it, it shouldn't. And the, that fear is a real thing. And that uh, anxiety is a real thing. You know, I'm never going to tell somebody that they shouldn't be scared of snakes because it's, a, it's a, a feeling that you have. It is a legitimate one, but the more that you can learn about them and the more that you can kind of question where those feelings come from and why you feel them and are they justified feelings? That is the path that you can take to make it so that you are not as scared of them to where it's manageable and you can, and, um, and feel good about where you're at. You're, you're okay. Even if you have rattlesnakes that visit your property, you're, you're going to be okay. Just don't sleep on it. Take the appropriate actions when you can and, um, and you'll be fine. So, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak with your community. I really appreciate uh, this kind of thing. I enjoy talking to uh, people that 
um, in homes, uh, more so than I do at a nature center where everyone kind of agrees with me already. I, I feel that uh, people that take the time to learn about the situation, um, uh, it's, it's a much more fruitful discussion. So uh, if you have any other questions, you can send me um, a message. Uh, actually, before I go, I'll show you this, this guy that's been sitting in the corner here quietly this whole time. This is one of our rattlesnakes. This is a speckled rattlesnake. Lives here in Phoenix. This is not an albino. It's just a really pretty one. They live in an area with uh, white granite. And I use this guy because even people that really hate the way that snakes look, this guy is a good ambassador because sometimes he gets people to challenge that. Because even if you hate snakes, you look at this guy, it looks like a cookies and cream shape. And you have to think that he's at least a little pretty, right? So, um, all right. Well, thank you very much. Have a good uh, Wednesday. <laughs> See ya.